Good afternoon. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you all from the Gadigal lands of the Euro Nation. I'd also like to acknowledge the ancestral lands that we are all joining from, and I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Thank you for joining us for this afternoon's Protecting Country or Extraction Panel discussion hosted by the Sydney Environment Institute. The Sydney Environment Institute is a global leader in multidisciplinary environmental research. It brings together key thinkers from the university and beyond to address critical environmental challenges. My name is Susan Park. I'm a professor of global governance at the University of Sydney, current acting deputy director of the Sydney Environment Institute and research lead of the Unsettling Resources Project. This event is part of the Sydney Environment Institute's extraction series that probes the use, impact and future of gas, coal and lead extraction in Australia at a critical point in our changing climate. I'd like to now pass over to the chair for this evening's event, Tess Lee, who is a Professor of Anthropology and Cultural Studies here at the University of Sydney. Her most recent book, Wild Policy, explores the relationship between Australia's militarised dependence on the extractive industry and substandard Indigenous policy responses. Over to you, Tess. Thanks, Susan, so much, and for the privilege of opening um, your important series with our event tonight, looking at the Macafra River mine, uh, the travesties there, and the fight for environmental justice that are taking place right now. Um, in thinking about what our panellists are doing in common tonight, I think it's fairly simple, profound, but simple. We're thinking through how well our systems of justice the very systems that have delivered environmental injustice, can these systems deliver justice in the future? Thinking about this tonight, we've got an extraordinary panel coming to us from Borolula. We have Josephine Davy, who's a Gurundji woman and traditional owner for the Makafa River region in the Gulf, where Glencore operates the Makafa River mine. This is one of the world's largest lead, zinc and silver mines. Josie, with other family members, has been at the forefront of trying to protect their sacred sites, their water and fisheries, which were all threatened by Glencore's giant open cut pit and the massive waste rock dump that Glencore has said will need managing for the next 1,000 years. Jack Green, Wungali, is a senior Gadara leader, artist, and cultural warrior from the Southwest Gulf of Carpentaria region. Of the, over the past 40 years, Jack has worked to regain ownership and protect Aboriginal lands throughout the area. In 2005, he set up Garawa and Wa'anyi ranges, and in 2015, he was instrumental in establishing the Gunalanja Minderabirana Indigenous Protected Area. Jack is also a board member of the Aboriginal Areas Protection Authority. The authority is an independent statutory body established under the Northern Territory Aboriginal Sacred Sites Act, and it's responsible for overseeing the protection of Aboriginal sacred sites over land and sea over the whole of the Northern Territory. So Jack's worried for his own country, he's worried for country everywhere. Jack's artworks document settler colonialism and its impacts on his people, country and laws and customs. And these are held in numerous national and international collections. Jack, Josie. When we first started to try and get back into the mine, we got pulled up. There was a chopper flying over the head with us on the helicopter to stop us to go in on the south side of um, the mine lease. So we pulled out of it and come back. Then we come back over, then we organize a protest down the track to try and get in the mines. We did one part of it, but then the copper arts has to move from there. So we had to walk back out from the mine site because we was in the lease. Under Aboriginal law, he's not the mining company lease. He's not the government lease, he's our lease. If we own the country, we own the land. And that's where we always say that um, that land, it's important. 
all of our um, modern territory, you know, we own that land according to our law and culture. And um, we went to court over it. While we was waiting to go to court, is um, Glencore was still digging the diversion of the river. So we won the court and they were still digging. So I, I can't understand that it's still tickling in my mind because a lot of my old people have been up there um, singing and so proud when we won the court, they was walking out, teeth was pouring out of their eye. And they was really happy that they got the um, court won. But then later it's been overriding and that a lot of old people sort of passed away from there on because they felt no good. And um, sorry, I can't um, read or write or anything like I was saying. I'm just sort of having it all in my head and memory from the time when how this thing happened. And we still hear today when we see that our uh, mind's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it, to, to me, it looked like um, we still doesn't get recognized by the government, by the mining company. And it's here to Aboriginal people. I understand my people have gone work there with the mines to put food on the table, but they, we still hear it when we see all that thing happen. We talks about it. What I'd like to see government and the mining company, if they come up with some idea, they need to come and sit down with us under the mango tree, under the um, tamarind tree, and sit down and talk about them. Like um, I done a painting on how people used to be here in Borola. We used to sit down and talk about the issue, whether it's ceremony or whether it's um, government coming in with some policy and things like that. You know, it's a heart of Aboriginal people. We we fight that one with four clan groups. If you can see on my painting, it's sort of we have four clan groups painted up and dancing under that area because it's important to Aboriginal people. And that's why we um, it's sort of art to all Aboriginal people. That's how we used to come together, four clan groups come together and sit down and talk about issue that um, we need to sort it out. But today it's sort of taken away from Aboriginal people, taken away and make us come to um, big shed and things like that to talk about. What I would like to see, if we're gonna talk about this issue that's gonna get things sorted out, we don't need people to fly in and frack off. We need government or the mining company to come in and sit down and talk to us properly. Don't speak with two tongues. Speak with what they want to do. So we all need to work on that. And it, it doesn't only, only have Aboriginal people, they have the people that ran this area too, that you know, a lot of a lot of pastors sort of happen the same way sometimes, you know, they feel no good. You got this um, um when they first start off with um they done a land claim, tried to get a land claim over Borolula, Bing Bong, Tawala. Then overnight, they just come and bought the place right in under our faces. I remember my um, um, brother-in-law was fighting very hard, Leo Finley at the time, when, when they came in and bought this thing straight under Yangla and Mara and Karo people and hurt a lot of people feeling for what they'd done. They should realize this is our country, this is our land. We're the First Nation. We need to be recognized and work equally. Not them keep putting Aboriginal people down and making decisions for us. We need to make our own decision so we can understand each other. But to me, I think Aboriginal people in this area, we are Aboriginal um, people a political football for the government and the mining company. We need to sit down and sort this out. Enough is enough. And stop, stop in buying people with um, 
um, plate full of ice cream and peanut and butter and all that, you know, stop it. Stop and let us decide to come together and pull together, not sort of uh, mm -hmm. teaching us on one side, dragging us away from our country. MacArthur River, it's owned by Mumbalia people and that country owned by old Jack Davy. Jack Davy was the king, senior people, ceremony, Jungai men for MacArthur River mine. They're called Jirinmini. And to me, how I see, they're not recognizing the younger kids that connected to that land. They need to recognize the proper tears of that country. Don't bring in other people in. It create a problem between family who start arguing over country then. And that's got to stop and recognize the proper TL for area. See, if, you, if you've if you done it, bing bong, you do the same thing with Daniela people. You speak to the right people. You got something on Garo country, you speak with Garo people. And the, the Mingiringi of that country, white people call him owner, we call him Mingiringi. White people call him policeman. We call him um, Jungai to, to make sure that how law we can understand each other. We can't understand with this little thing when they come up hard word and things like that. It's very hard for our people to understand. We need to sit down together and fix it up properly, and go back in our own law and culture. Yes, Thank you so much, Jack and Josie in the background there. Um, that was very powerful. And those paintings say a lot, even without reading and writing. I'm gonna turn now um, to Sean Kierens, who's worked with Jack and Josie and many other Garara, Kundanji, Mara, Yanua and Wanyi people in the Gulf country for years now, working with them and assisting the with the establishment of ranger groups and indigenous protected areas, as well as documenting the impacts of Macarfa River Mine on the region's peoples, lands, waters, and customary laws. Sean's an anthropologist, um, and being an anthropologist who's also so engaged with people, it's an important job. So, Sean. Thanks for that, uh, Jack and Josie. Um, I'll just follow up with um, some things that Jack and Josie have been touching on. One of the most powerful things in the Gulf country is the Aboriginal law and custom that Garawa, Gadanji, Mara and Yanyua people hold. This is the basis of their sovereignty. It's something that's never been ceded. There's never been any document signed between the Australian state and Indigenous peoples where they have surrendered their sovereignty. And it's something that they have fought for and died for now for centuries. The Gulf country was violent when Europeans first invaded, killing hundreds of people, men, women, children, and babies. There's over 50 massacre sites in the Gulf country, and it was an incredibly dangerous place for people. Garora and Gadanji, Maru and Yanua people managed to survive. They managed to live on those harsh conditions on those pastoral stations under slave labor, like conditions, but they held their laws and customs. And the first opportunity they got, they were able to win their land back when Australian white law first recognised them as Indigenous peoples. And while the Gulf country was a dangerous place in the, in the times of the invasion and right up until the 1920s, the Gulf country today is still a dangerous place. It's an effective frontier. It's a place where and um, uh, international capital are working together, hand in hand, so they can extract minerals and now gas, while in the process severing ecological condition, um, ecological ecological connections, and discarding ecological waste. And in the process, they are creating extractive subjects. And what I mean by that is. The Northern Territory government and the Australian government are very absent in this relationship between Glencore, one of the world's largest mining companies, and Indigenous peoples. They're not providing good health services, homeland education, um, housing, all these other citizenship rights that Indigenous people deserve. And why they're absent from this space, 
the mining company is there. The mining company is able to put together what they call a community benefits trust that was designed by the mine and the government without any involvement of indigenous peoples. And it is the mine that decides where money goes. Uh, they are the dominant people on this committee. They have a representative from each of the four groups, but they're not chosen by these groups. Um, and this is something that the uh, MacArthur River Mine has been doing since they first moved into the region in the 1970s is dividing people. Documents from the 1990s show how MacArthur River Mine people wouldn't, wouldn't come and speak in these large meetings that Jack was talking about. They're trying to get people outside of the meetings. They like to talk about having personalized one-on-one -on -one relationships. This is classic settler colonialism, where they are able to divide people and extract resources at a cheap cost. And while um, Indigenous peoples have been fighting to protect their, their land and their sacred sites, there's just been a plethora of environmental problems where we're seeing um, uh, fish being contaminated with lead. We're seeing over 400 cattle shot because some can... Um, have tested positive for lead. We've seen the um, waste rock dump that Tess mentioned that will be needing to be managed for 1,000 years, um, self-combusting and blowing sulfur dioxide over the Gulf country. Um, the, the independent monitor has been talking for years now about the uh, leakage of acid and saline waters from that waste rock dump into the region's water supplies. Every time the independent monitor reported, this was a major issue. But lo and behold, the independent monitor has now been removed. And Glencore, working with the Northern Territory government, were able to choose who the new independent monitor was. And the release of their first report two years late, all of these problems that have been identified in the past have now disappeared. So this is where I go back to saying, in the, in the past, it was a dangerous place for indigenous peoples with the settler guns. And today it is a dangerous place where people aren't sure if there's lead in their water, lead in the fish, lead in the animals they want to, want to eat, or perhaps lead in their bodies. And the whole time they're watching the creep of this waste rock dump that is massive, slowly inching towards these very important sacred sites and the mine is determined to either destroy them or desecrate them. Um, and this is something that uh, the people of the Gulf have been fighting for. And as you'll see, I think when, and Kirsty will talk, that the Australian laws are so weak. They're being made not for Indigenous peoples, they ignore the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but it's all about extraction and how we can cap help international capital rape and pillage indigenous lands, pay few taxes, contaminate, and then leave. And it'll be Jack, uh, Josie, and many others, great, great, great grandchildren that will be bearing the cost of these developments. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, again, lots, lots for us to think about and digest. Um, and really important to point out that the Gulf country is violent in a different way today. Um, it's, it's the, the, the blood on the hands of the settlers is still there, but it comes from just a different uh, means of delivering that violence. Um, so we're going to switch now to Dr. Kirsty Howey, who is co-director of the Northern Territory Environment Centre and also research associate at Deakin University. Kirsty's worked as a native title and a land rights lawyer for over a decade in the Northern Territory. That includes being an instructing solicitor, acting on behalf of traditional owners, challenging the approvals that made the Macarthur River mine possible. So she too has a long history with the issues in this part of our country. Her PhD thesis, uh, which is a stunning piece of work, 
explored the nexus between Indigenous land rights, environmental governance and development in Northern Australia. Kirsty. Thank you, Tess. Um, and I want to start by acknowledging uh, where I'm speaking from on Larrakia country and their custodianship and care of these unceded land and waters over many millennia. And I also, of course, want to acknowledge the lands and the struggles of the Gadanji, Garawa, Mara and Yanua people of whose country we're speaking of today and to acknowledge your work, Jack and Josie, over decades uh, now, over 40 years, contending with this mine and its damage. So I'm today going to talk briefly about, you know, the, the technical uh, underpinnings of the way that extractive capitalism and extractive development such as this work in Australia and further afield as well. And I want to talk about how laws that are meant to protect the environment have effectively facilitated the advance of contamination over vast time scales at MacArthur River Mine. So I'm going to suggest that environmental law, which is a bit of a misnomer, and itself is a permeable pathway through which what Rob Nixon calls slow violence, if I can, uh, gains traction. And there's a quote, a, a quote there from his book. So I'm not going to delve very much into the fraught and contentious history of the MacArthur River Mine, except to make a few key points that elaborate uh, to some extent on what Jack and Josie have said and Sean as well. So first of all, the lead zinc and silver deposit, which is currently being mined by Glencore, was located under the tropical MacArthur River, whose water can extend four kilometres wide at the mine site in the wet season. And the river runs from the mine site straight through the town at Cleves Borolula in two and out into the Gulf of Carpentaria. And of course, it's been a vital source of sustenance for Aboriginal people there for up to 65,000 years. And you can see there uh, in the, the image I'm sharing, that's a, a view of the MacArthur River from Borolula, about uh, 40 kilometres downstream of the mine site, and it's looking up towards the mine in the middle of the wet season. Um, the mine's history has been characterised by, frankly, extraordinary efforts by governments to facilitate its development, whatever the cost. And most famously, um, and Jack and Sean both spoke about this, this included the conversion of the mine from an underground to an open cut mine in the late 2000s. And that needed the river to be diverted, this river you see in front of you, for some six kilometres, with the open cut pit to be dug in the banks of the old riverbed. And this was despite near unanimous opposition led by traditional owners and uh, local people such as, as Jack and Josie, and two successful court cases, um, which nonetheless weren't able to stop uh, the open cut mine from going ahead. So a few years after Peter Garrett, as the Environment Minister, gave the final approval for MacArthur River Mines open cut operation, in 2013, the mine's waste rock dump spontaneously combusted, caused by oxygen and water meeting peritic rock in its top layers and producing sulphur dioxide and smoke. Um, and it turned out the mine had got its original estimate of the pro proportion of potentially acid forming rock catastrophically wrong. Instead of 11% of acid forming rock, it was more like 90%. The main risk associated with this is something called acid mine drainage, which uh, Sean spoke about. And this can cause uh, the seepage into water systems over millennia of, of acid and heavy metals. Um, and effectively what happened was, um, this smoke was a sign of extreme heat within the waste rock dump as the rock was effectively dissolved um, and then caused, caused combustion on the surface. So when this started happening, the Northern Territory's Environment Protection Authority called for yet another environmental impact assessment of the mine. There have been a few over the years, but problems kept mounting up and Sean discussed some of them, such as heavy metals in fish, contaminated cattle, um, and the mine disclosing for the first time in the course of this assessment that the monitoring for the mine would be needed, uh, at management in some form, uh, up until the year 3037. 
So despite the knowledge that this acid mine drainage is still occurring and it's still occurring, late last year, the mine's proposal to fix this problem, uh, and that's, I use the term fix euphemistically, was approved by the government. The security bond for the, for the mine, which is meant to cover the costs of rehabilitating the site if the mine walks away early, was slashed by $120 million from $520 million to $400 million. Despite uh, numerous advice, including from the Environment Protection Authority, that the existing bond couldn't come close to covering the costs of rehab, including for the necessary thousand years of monitoring. And uh, lots of things have happened since then. There's been constant media stories almost by the month. Um, but uh, one thing that's currently ongoing is that together with Jack Green and Josie Davey, the Environment Centre has commenced proceedings in the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory, challenging that decision to reduce the security bond. So in a little over 10 years, the mine has unleashed a monster and trying to stop its impacts is a battle with space and time. Acid mine drainage is characterised by its slow emergence, incremental movement and longevity, and it, it can take thousands of years for it to uh, reveal itself, well after all reserves are depleted and mines closed and rehabilitated. So how can this possibly happen? I say that environmental law has a lot to do with it. While appearing to be rational, technical and mundane, Law provides the structures to facilitate slow violence, operating often within particular configurations of space and time that are very narrow. So of note, I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that the, the moments of public controversy about MacArthur River Mine have occurred at really specific times when legal authorization under relevant environmental legislation of different stages of the project loomed. And when this happens, a combination of different legal jurisdictions interlocks. So you have the grant of mineral titles and the approval of mining documentation under mining legislation. You've got environmental impact assessments under environmental protection laws. You've got the grant of licenses under water legislation. You've got the grant of sacred sites uh, authority certificates uh, under relevant laws as well. And project approval is also when public access to what's going on at the mine, uh, these information that's otherwise opaque, um, is, is available. And so public and media attention is also skewed towards these times of project authorization, because that's the only time you know what's going on, something of what's going on. So there's a cluster of legal, political and ins institutional arrangements that concentrate pressure on project approvals triggered by developers. And this period can, can vary. It can be a few months to the six years it took for the approval to be given to fix the smoking waste rock dump at MacArthur River Mine. And this seems to developers like a long period of time and to governments as well, but compared to other timescapes, not least of which is the proposed and projected impacts of the mine of a thousand years, it's a very short period. So politicians, bureaucrats, activists, scientists, lawyers, the media, we're all complicit in this time compression. And uh, our expertise and our attention is front-ended uh, through via, via these separate yet overlapping legal jurisdictions. So environmental law creates the sense that these are the moments that really matter. And of course they do. But the waiting is deceptive because outside of these periods, the miners' impacts go on, unconstrained by the same legal timetable over which the public and others fret. So after approval, what happens in a legal sense? In Australia, as everywhere in the world, monitoring and compliance of environmental impacts is under-resourced. Uh, and this is not just sort of a kink in the system, it's a core feature. It's what allows mining to become a lawful pollution machine. While the scrutiny of multiple intersecting laws rains down during windows of project approvals, the legal screws are often taken off for the duration of a project's operations. So the law may be there, but it has little purchase. And from what is available to the public about MacArthur River Mine, uh, it seems that the mine is permitted to contaminate the mine site. For example, the EPA has said in its most recent assessment that acid mine drainage will continue to be generated for the duration of mining, and this is a quote, 
is likely to percolate into the base into groundwater via permeable pathways. And so the contention seems to be that as long as these impacts are constrained for now and confined to the mine site, this is okay. But of course, water makes a mockery of this neat spatial and temporal partition. Acid mine drainage gains uneven traction over a huge time scale, facilitated by water, which defies fixity, and its impacts are often hidden or delayed. Acid mine drainage may not manifest for centuries far away from the mine site well after the mine has been closed and rehabilitated. What happens then? As Tess has said, um, there are questions about who will pay. Post-closure and post-abandonment, the law peters out. Indeed, by the time the mine's true impacts are known, the state as we know it may well have disappeared. And who knows if successor jurisdictions will assume its toxic liabilities. In writing about the forms of existence that are sacrificed by settler colonialism's progress towards its own horizon, Elizabeth Povinelli notes that it's the black and brown bodies interned in the brackets of recognition that are thrown overboard. And what does MacArthur River Mine tell us about these brackets? So I've attempted to describe how environmental governance in Australia is characterised by an arsenal of overlapping, hidden and porous juris legal jurisdictions that arrange time and space in particular ways. So while individually, while each of these laws looks fit for purpose, analysed together and considering the unpredictable seepage of things like acid mine drainage, they are themselves permeable pathways for contamination. And this game of legal jurisdiction is expertly navigated by corporations in the state, all the while retain, retaining this sheen of objective apolitical legality. So understanding how this works, the spatio-temporal machinery of jurisdiction moves us towards an understanding of the how of slow violence and law's role in it. And just to end, I just want to draw your attention to Jack and Josie's uh, Twitter handle, uh, so you can follow them on Twitter. Also encourage you to look at the outstanding exhibition that's currently online called Lead in My Grandmother's Body, which is a collaboration between Sean, Jack and Josie, uh, Therese Ritchie and other members of Borrelula community. And you can, of course, sign up to become part of the campaign to stop the damage caused by MacArthur River Mine. And I've given the web address there. Thank you. Thank you so very much, everybody. We've actually generated through all of your stunning presentations, lots of questions. Um, so I'm going to have, have the first of these from Tiana. I hope that's the correct pronunciation. She asks, what is the effect of the mining activity on the cultural heritage of the land? Does it have an impact on the physical, spiritual significance of the land? I wonder, Jack, if you might answer that one. Does mining impact the spiritual it nature does. of the land? Yes, it does. It, um People need to understand we um Aboriginal people we have connection to the rainbow and they dug, dug that river up. That's where a lot of our people passed away. And for us as an Aboriginal people, we feel real noble. Even so, it's blocked to um, Davies, but rest of us that ran here, we have the same feeling because there's a lot of um it's like a garden to all Australians, especially for Aboriginal people, because that's their food there, that's their garden, you know. You know, we got everything there. Oh. It's grown bush, bush tucker, so we can't get in there at the moment because we're a little bit afraid, family bit afraid whether we're gonna um, pick up something that might poison us, you know, so we have to go away from that place to look for most of bush tucker. That's an important place that one day, one day dug it up. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Next question, uh, maybe Sean, could you answer this one? Um, from Andrea Gaynor, who thanks Jack and Josie for your efforts to defend your country and your people, and asks Sean to say a bit more about the concept of extractive subjects. 
what characterizes such subjects and can you suggest some further reading? Okay, you can read um, uh, Fredrickson and Himley, The Tax Tactics of Dispossession. And it's kind of theoretical ideas of this withdrawal of the state and then the international capitalists who are able to work directly with people to undermine indigenous laws and customs. You have to think back to 2007 when the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was um, uh, promulgated from the United Nations. There it talks about a fundamental right of Indigenous peoples to be able to organize um, and represent themselves under their own laws and customs. And this is something that is in the notion of sovereignty that Jack and Josie and many others hold. But this is not with what the Northern Territory government, despite them saying to Jack and Josie, we'd like a treaty with you, at the same time undermining their sovereignty. And so what, what that's doing is instead of meeting Aboriginal people under their own structures, their own institutions, their own laws and entering into a dialogue with them, the mining company is able to, as Jack paints in some of his paintings, throw Toyota motor cars out in front of people, free fuel each month for the life of the mine, a cash um, uh, payment when all the environmental processes are through to particular people under the guise of outstation um, or homeland um, funding. And what it does, it makes people who are exposed as people who are vulnerable, even more vulnerable. And where is the Australian state in there that is protecting its citizens, recognising its responsibilities under the UN Declaration um, of Indigenous Peoples' Rights and sitting alongside Indigenous people and supporting them and working with them? What I see is the Australian government and the Northern Territory government are working for people overseas. It's like they've abandoned Indigenous peoples in this country. It's the same thing when they invaded this land. They just came to push people aside, extract resources, which in those early days was beef um, in the north, and now it is minerals. Um, and this, this is the vulnerability of what extractive, creating extractive subjects are. Mm. True, true that. So from Tiana again, if you could get everyone to sit down under that tamarind tree, what do you think could happen through discussions with the government and mining company? Well, that's me. Eh? Yeah. I reckon um, if we can sit down and talk about it and explain to our people and young people together and we can oh. come up with some sort of agreement it, it mightn't come up the way they got because we got a feeling of this country as well that was that was a little broken up but i think what you're saying is because you're here and this land needs you're responsible for this land together you could help the government and the mining company is that right? That's, um, yeah, that's right. They need to come and sit down and speak to the proper owner. Yeah. Sure do. Of this country. So we can sit down and maybe talk about it. Because sometimes the agreement with government and mining company just throw it on our lap and we're struggling how to get around that. And if we can sit down under the shade of tree and spend a couple of days, we can get things sorted out properly. You know, at one of my um, paintings are flying and frack off, you know. So that's what they've been doing in the last few years. They just come in, talk to us, jump on the plane. Oh, I gotta go, I got an important meeting in Darwin, important meeting in Melbourne, Sydney, and all that sort of crap. And we're still wondering how can we work around this thing to try and sort it out properly. Mm. Thank you, Jack. Kirsty, I have a question for you, which is, you mentioned a lot of court cases, um, a lot of time sort of, which I imagine means going through a lot of detail and a lot of paperwork. Um, how resourced are the organisations that are doing that work for that immense labour? 
Um, well, I mean, I think the answer to that is terribly resourced, uh, including in relation to um, the mining companies and the governments who we're trying to hold to account. Um, you know, there's, I, I'm working at the Environment Centre at the moment, and like many environmental organisations across Australia, it's subject to peaks and troughs in funding, including by governments, and was, you know, quite recently, six or seven years ago, completely brought to its knees by cutting of all government funding, um, which then has forced uh, us and other groups to try to be incredibly resourceful with where we can simply survive to do this really important task, which is crucial to democratic institutions and governance generally in countries like Australia, holding, holding government and companies to account over what they're doing. And, you know, you're constantly stretched um, trying to keep on top of the thousands of pages of documents. The smoking gun might be on page, you know, 1,500 of 3,000 pages of appendices to an environmental report, and you've got to find some way of finding that smoking gun or that information that's key. Um, and you're embroiled in what I think Tess, you and I have called in another paper, paper fair. Um, and it's, it's relentless. And frankly, uh, it is a form of administrative slow violence that uh, ensures that there's a constant turnover of staff and organisations themselves trying to do this vitally important work. And, um, you know, that's no secret to many people who will be, be listening in, but um, it's really difficult. And another tactic, frankly, of settler colonialism and governments to ensure that they can uh, do what they want with minimal scrutiny um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I was trying to spare Jack, but there's another question for him. We've got a big audience out there, Jack. Um, That's okay. <laughs> so Lisa Stefanoff is asking if you can tell us something about how young people are affected by the mine and how they're growing up into that work of defending country in the shadow of the mine. I mean, the younger kids today, younger people that have grown up, it's sort of, you know, they don't, um, they want to listen to Aboriginal people, but, but because of a lot of um, seeing the elders talking to them all the time, but at the same time, they're still sort of, to us, they sort of start to wander away, you know, and sometimes, yeah, but beside that, people trying to really, hold them together as much as we can to try and get them to understand. Once they come to um, Christmas time, holiday ceremony and things like that, they come to it, you know, and they, they're really good. But once they come back into town, and I reckon they're wandering away from a lot of things that what um, the company is putting a lot of um, money into sports and um, disco and things like that, you know. And I feel as an elder of Borolula, one of the elders of Borolula and culture man, they've taken that kids away from us. They, got, they don't under, um, start learning more about our law and culture. We, we try our best to try and get them to understand more. But these days they all go for disco and all this sort of thing, you know, walking around on the street at night. And we're really worried as the elders of this world. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming. Jack and Josie, Rachel O'Reilly want to let you know that your paintings and also your talks are seen and heard in the cities all around the world. And it's really powerful. Her question for all of you, for Sean and Jack, Josie and Kirsty, is how can we make it so it's just normal that researchers and allies and collaborators that we are talking more about the deep time of corporate activity, that long, uh, long years where their pollution can just do what it wants to do and there's no one around. 
Um, so that deep time and the mining industry's cultural work that what you were just saying, how they support discos and they support um, playgrounds and they make themselves key. What's the impact of those really strong, solid exhibitions, do you think, in trying to get that awareness up? Um, I'm sort of an old fashioned. I've been through a lot of mills in my past, you know, and I, 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 it's very hard for ourselves now today to teach our kids about country to teach our kids about um, bush tucker and things like that and tell them how did that bush tucker connect to certain group. Um, in our law, we all got different skin group, you know, uh, something that you might not understand. It might be that certain people would understand. We call it Wealia, Udalia, Mambalia, Rumbria. So each kid from that group, it, it sort of, we need to try and teach them more about all these sort of things. I take my kids out of there every weekend, out of town, but when they come to that, four or five, um, three or four o'clock, they want to come back in town for their phone and that, you know, so they can talk. It's just sort of crazy for us now, and they sit up half of the night just um, on the phone, you know, and I keep on saying to my own kid, I said, look, you, you don't need to watch that all the time. It's no good to you, you know? And it happened to all the kids in, in this region. I mean, you know, Borolula, Catherine, Tennant Creek, Dumaji, um, we connected all over on our family line. And you can see what happened in other places too. Kids drifting away, kids start stealing, kids start breaking in and all these sort of things, you know? It's not too bad at the moment here in Borola. It's been cut down a bit, but we want to bring him down a bit more so they can understand more better. Sean, did you have anything you wanted to say about that collaboration and how important it is that researchers do it? I think collaboration is vital, um, but it's kind of a bit skewed these days where everybody starts to talk about co-design. But that's often where the researchers are in there with the project, and then they go and find a community. The work that we've been doing in Borolula is often driven by Jack, Nancy McDinney, Stuart Hooson, and many other people. It's their ideas. Us as researchers need to be tools to work with Indigenous people, to use our ability to sit along shoulder to shoulder with people. Ask people, so what is it that you want to do? What are the problems that you're wanting to expose? How can we work with you? And I think that's missing from the universities today where these other agendas are set and top-down research continues under the under this name of now co-design, where everything's co-design. It's another form of separate colonialism. I agree, that's powerful. Kirsty, any final comments from you? Um, just in response to Rachel's question, you know, how do we how do we hold on to, to deep time? I have to say it's, it's, it's really, really hard and we're up against it. Um, we're always looking for the next new thing to oppose or to support. At the moment, it's fracking in the Northern Territory and I wholeheartedly support all efforts to see off that industry and its cat potentially catastrophic impacts. But there's a forgetting as we rush to the next big thing that we're going to fight, there's a forgetting that happens. And I think in the case of MacArthur River Mine, I'll also point out Ranger Uranium Mine, which was probably the most contentious mine ever in the history of Australia and was authorised in appalling circumstances over 40 years ago. That closed in January this year. And it's pretty difficult to get everyone's attention on these you know, legacies, these toxic legacies that are going to be around for millennia, that are going to impact people living there on that country for, I mean, you know, so many generations. Um, and I just implore uh, everyone who's listening in on this call not to forget and to stay with uh, what we've unleashed because we've been part of this unleashing directly or indirectly uh, by Glencore 
by, uh, you know, what's happened at Ranger Uranium Mine and at Legacy Mines across uh, the whole of Australia and not just mines, all sorts of other developments as well. And we, uh, we have a moral responsibility to, to stay with uh, the people who are left behind as we move on to the next thing to fight or support. Yeah. I'm going to um, take the opportunity now to thank you all so much for, despite all the technology issues, giving us such powerful material to think with tonight. Um, Jack, Josie, Kirsty, Sean, uh, the Sydney Environment Institute and Susan uh, for hosting us. Thank you so much. In the small amount of time, I think you've really opened eyes and hearts, I hope, to ongoing issues that we need to reckon with. Susan, I'm going to throw to you because I think you've got some finishing things to say. Thank you, yes, and thank you to all the speakers and to all the participants of today's event. Thank you for letting us bear witness to the slow violence that is taking place in the MacArthur River Mine. Um, I would like to um, watch out for news and upcoming events from the Sydney Environment Institute. Feel free to subscribe to our monthly newsletter. There will be a link in the chat and or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. So I look forward to seeing more events about Australia's fossil fuel addiction, greed from our gas-led recovery and whether or not climate finance can help us meet the climate challenge. Thank you all and have a good afternoon.